So yeah, so well, well good evening everyone, or good afternoon for, um, for those joining us from uh, out, out in America. Um, thanks for signing up and obviously a massive thank you to, uh, to Angie for, for joining us this evening. Um, like I said, I'll say a few words, a bit of background and, and a bit of a call for help. Uh, so for those of you that, that don't know me, my name is Barry Crumford. Uh, I'm the founder of the London Java community. Um, I'm not a developer myself. I run a, a tech recruitment company called Recworks. Uh, so, so here at Recworks, we've been on a mission for the last 12 years to prove that recruitment can be a, a force for good in the tech industry beyond just getting people jobs. And that's specifically around learning, mentoring, career development, and, and that kind of thing. So put simply, if, if people want to learn and, and people are happy to share or, or teach, that, then we want to bring them together. Uh, and that can be on a group basis, like, like today, and, and through communities like the LJC, or, or on a one-to-one -one level. Uh, so one of the biggest things that, that we do, the biggest examples of what we do is, is the Meet a Mentor community. And that's got really close links to the LJC. Um, so it's, it's something we, we organize introductions between mentees and mentors at all levels. Uh, so everyone from, from students all the way up to, to CTOs or, or aspiring speakers. Uh, and this is what we need help with. Uh, so we've, got, um, we've always got new, new members. We've made now 2,500 introductions. And we've got like 1,700 members there, but we're always getting new members. So if there's anybody out there that wants to get involved in mentoring or answer a few questions, help out, uh, then please let me know. Find me on LinkedIn or uh, I'll drop a, I'll drop a uh, note on the, on the chat here. Um, everything we do, though, it's all, all powered by recruitment. Uh, so if you're looking to hire um, or you know anyone that is, then please bear RecWorks in mind. Anyway, on to tonight. Like I say, very, very pleased to, to have Angie here with us. Uh, I'm going to hand over now to my co-host, Nikita, uh, who's going to say a few words to introduce Angie. I hope you all have a great evening. Hi. Uh, to be honest, it was quite a surprise for me because I just saw this amazing post on LinkedIn because you might not know, but Angie, Angie she's, you actually, she, actually, you should know, she's quite famous in Java community. And she's not only uh, one of the only 300, I think, Java champions in the world, but she's also the very first uh, black lady to join them. So she's inspiration for millions, I would say. And she has, she, it's hard to start, but she has 25 patents, I believe. And she's also involved in charities and she's teaching test automation. And she's doing test automation. And uh, yeah, I, I think, we can ask more questions and then, <laughs> but she's doing so much. So yeah, welcome. Thank you so much, Nikita and Barry. Thank you everyone for coming. So glad to see you all. Um, yes, I'm Angie. I love Java, as you probably know. I teach free courses at Test Automation University, including a Java programming course. So if you know anyone who needs to learn Java, send them my way. Um, Selenium web driver with Java, visual testing with Java, as well as a couple of others as well. Now, while Java is still the leading programming language, shout out to us, uh, it has gotten a bad rep over the years, right? So some of the biggest gripes I've heard are things like Java is too verbose, meaning we have to write a lot of boilerplate code to do the most basic things, yeah? and that the language was not evolving fast enough. So the releases of Java 7, 8, and 9 were all three years apart, right? Which is almost a lifetime <laughs> in software development terms. The powers that be have heard us loud and clear, and Java has gotten a much needed makeover. And now new versions of the language are being released every six months. With so many new features, it may be hard to keep up. So in this talk, I want to demonstrate some of the newer features of Java that I love and how we can take advantage of them in writing our code. So we're going to look at some test code today, but everything is applicable to your development code as well. But I wanted something common that maybe we all could understand. Okay, so we're going to look at the code for verifying this banking page. The specific test we'll go over today is just going to make sure that all of these accounts are listed. So here's our test code. Let me walk you through it. 
So here we're logging into the application and we get a handle to this accounts overview page. This is where that table of accounts is located. Next, we get a list of all of the account numbers that are displayed on the page. Then we want to get the expected accounts. So this test data can change. So we're actually gonna make a call to an API to get the expected accounts. And this returns a list of deserialized objects, account objects. And we want to make a new list which will contain the account numbers as strings as opposed to the entire account. So we loop through the list of account objects and click the add to account number from each account into our list of expected accounts, all right? Finally, we compare both lists to make sure that every account for this customer is actually shown on the site. Now, this was written in Java 8, so we're gonna go through it and see how we can modernize it using some of the latest features in Java. Let's start here with the declaration of the accounts overview page. So as you can see here, we're following Java conventions. We're using good names for both our class and our object. However, many times as we see here, these two names end up being the same thing, right? So this is redundant. It makes for a lot of typing. So in version 10, Java introduced type inference for local variables. This is like my favorite. What this means is that instead of explicitly declaring the object or variables type, we can instead use this keyword var. And Java will infer what the type is based on what is being assigned to it. Like I said, this is my favorite new feature in Java because especially in test code, UI test code, we always have these long class names for our page models, and now we no longer need to type them out. Now, before you get carried away and you start using bar everywhere, let me explain the rules and also give you some tips. Now, this doesn't make Java a dynamically typed language like JavaScript or Python. That's a question that I often get when I talk about var. The type is still there, right? It's just inferred from the right-hand side of the statement, which means you can only use var if you're actually initializing the variable. Otherwise, Java won't be able to infer what the type is, right? Also, it only works for local variables. So you can use this inside of methods, loops, decision structures, but you cannot use this for global variables, even if you're initializing them. While local variable type inference can be used within the body of local constructs, it can't be used in the headers of methods or constructors. And this is because whoever's calling you, they need to know the data type of the arguments that they're gonna send. All right, so those are the rules. Now let's get into some guidelines. Given this variable, right, this variable name and this method, I have no idea what the inferred type of X would be. Sure, Java knows this, but me as the reader, I can't easily tell what this is. And so this makes it really difficult to work with this variable. So my suggestion uh, is to use good variable names. And that's the, that's the case all the time, right? We should always be using good variable names, but it's even more important if you're gonna use var. Once you start using this, you're gonna love it, but please don't overdo it. Using var here, <laughs> this doesn't do you any favors, right? Just type int. Int is three letters, var is three letters. Don't, don't just slap it everywhere, okay? So I've updated our test code to use vars. So I'm using var here and the inferred type is very clear to me based on the variable name that I chose, right? Here, I changed the variable name though from actual accounts to actual account IDs list so that now it's clear that this is a list and it's holding account IDs. 
For this one, I also changed the name from accounts to accounts list so that it's clear that this is a list holding account objects, right? So as you can see, like even though I was, I thought I was using pretty good variable names, typing those long uh, class data types still gives you some context. So removing those, you lose a little bit of context. So you might need to be even more intentional about how you name your variables. Here, I changed the name to be more representative, and I also explicitly defined the data type of the array list on the right-hand side. If I didn't use this diamond operator to indicate that this is a list of strings, then it would be inferred as a list of objects, which would be okay in this case, but it could get you into some trouble down the road because if I didn't have that and I just said array list, right? And this uh, then was inferred as a list of objects. If I did dot on expected account IDs list and wanted, um, not the list, but one of the elements within the list and wanted to, you know, get access to the string methods, I wouldn't have that because Java would think that this is an object, not a string per se, okay? Here I'm using var inside of a for loop just to show you that it can be done. Okay, let's see what else we can modernize here. How about we go inside of this accounts, get accounts method. Now, remember, this is the table and we're getting all of those values in the first column that's labeled account. And here is the code to do so. So we see here, it finds all of the account sales and these are web element objects. Then it creates a new list to hold just the text of the web elements. So this is a list of strings. To populate that list, we loop through each of the elements from line three, get their text, and then add them to our new list on line six. And then notice this method needs two lists and a loop. Fortunately, there's a more modern approach to do this in Java by using functional programming style. So this approach was actually added in Java 8, but I don't see it used much in test code. So I do wanna highlight it just briefly. This is much more streamlined. And here we still call find elements to get the list of web elements, but we don't need to store them. Instead, we turn them into a stream from which we can do some cool functional programming. So this map function will take those web elements and map them into whatever is passed into this. So here we're saying get the text from these web elements and then store them into a list which we return. Now here's an alternative way to write the map call. Notice in the top example, line five uses a shortcut or syntactic sugar, but in the bottom example, line, through, line three uses the fully spelled out approach and both are fine. Now we are gonna do the same thing in our test method. So instead of using the two list in a for loop, I use a stream in a map and then I map what I um, need into a single list. Now, it's a good practice to break up these chained method calls where each method is on a new line. And I know that it's really tempting to do this as like this big powerful call all on one line because it's like, wow, look at this wicked one-liner, right? But <laughs> it makes it harder to read your code and to process what it's actually doing. So it's a good practice to break it up so that each call is on a new line. All right, let's look at what's new with streams. So Java 9 introduces a couple of new methods to the stream, one being take while. So let's say I have this code, which gets the list of accounts, and then it uses the take while method on the stream of accounts. Within this take while method, you pass a condition, also known as a predicate. And this is saying to go through this list of accounts and accept all the ones that have a type of checking until you get to one that does not have this type. So here are all of the accounts stored in accounts list. Notice there's 11 of them. 
And when we say take while type is checking, we end up with a list of three accounts. And as you can see, it's the first three accounts from the accounts list. But when it got to the fourth account, the type was savings, so the stream is ended. Java 9 also introduced drop while, which does the opposite of take while. For this one, we're saying drop the accounts of type checking until you get to one that is not. So with 11 accounts here, we see the first three are checking, the fourth is saving, the fifth through ninth are checking, and the 10th one is saving, and then that last one is checking. So how many accounts do you think will be collected here in this checking accounts list? Take a moment and guess while, while I refresh. All right. If you said eight, you are correct. So this method dropped the first three accounts because they matched the predicate and then it stopped the stream. So all other accounts are collected and stored in the list. And all of the accounts couldn't fit on the last slide. So here's the full list of drop while account type is checking. All right. So you might be thinking, Angie, why on earth would I want to use take while and drop while? <laughs> the examples that I showed you were a bit of a brain tease because the lists weren't sorted. So the results weren't, were, they were indeterministic. However, if you sort the collection first, as we're doing here, it makes a lot more sense. And notice I'm using this comparator to specify which property I want this object sorted by. So given the sorted list, we see it collects all of the check-in accounts, and this actually makes more sense, right? Likewise for drop while. Okay, let's see what else we can modernize. How about, let's look inside of this get customer ID method. So this method is holding our test data. And based on the name on the account, it's returning the account ID. This is using switch statements. And notice we have to declare the variable, then specify each case we wanna handle. And inside of the case, we assign the value to ID, and then we must follow the assignment by a break statement to prevent fall through into the next case, which would override the variable. I actually um, accidentally did this in, um, not Java, um, PHP. I was coding in PHP just this weekend and had a fall through. So I laughed because I thought, ha ha, Java has, made this much easier not to break, right? <laughs> now, not only is this a lot of boilerplate code, but it's also risky, right? Like I just said, if you forget one of those break statements, this will return the wrong ID. In Java 12, switch expressions were introduced. Now you can use switch to directly assign a value to a variable. Notice here, we're using switch on the right side of a statement, to initialize the variable. The case statement doesn't need a colon in switch expressions, but instead it uses an arrow. And this is saying, if the name is John, then assign 12212 to the variable ID. Notice, I don't need a break statement here. There's no fall through with switch expressions. And I can even simplify this a bit more by removing the assignment here and just returning the result of the switch expression. Now using the lambda style arrows is one way to assign the value, but you can also use another approach. You can use the colon that we're used to, but if you do so, you need to follow that with the word yield. This is a bit more verbose, so I actually prefer to use the arrow. Now you can specify more than one case in a single case statement. Notice here, we're saying if the customer name is John or Demo, which is his last name, then the ID is 12212. 
And this makes up for the removal of fall through from switch expressions, which was a question I had as soon as I heard about switch, because I like a fall through sometimes, I use it sometimes, right? Um, but you can, this makes up for it because you can indicate all the cases delimited by a comma. You can also do more than just assign values. For example, here we're using the lambda style arrow followed by a set of curly braces to indicate that we have a block of code that we want to execute. And inside of this, uh, the body of this case, we can add more statements like this one. But if you do this, if you, if you use the curly braces to uh, execute a block, the last line of the case must yield a value to be returned. All right, let's talk about the rules of switch expressions. You'll need to use the arrows or the colon yield. You can't use both like this, right? So line three would give you a compilation error because it's a different kind of case. You can use yield with the arrows, but only in events like the last case where you're using the curly braces to execute a block within the case. You can use any of the cases to throw an exception, which is cool. So of course, in this case, no value is being returned for ID and the entire flow is interrupted by the execution. And in this example, I'm using it for the default case, but you can use it for any of the cases and in multiple cases. So if I wanted to throw an exception for Mary and for default, that's perfectly valid as well. This is not a replacement of the switch statement. It's an addition to the language, meaning you can still use switch statements, and in some cases, it might be the more favorable option. As a rule of thumb, use expressions when you are using switch to assign a value, and use statements when you're not using switch to assign values, but just to invoke statements, okay? All right, let's go back to our test. Let's go to this get accounts method, which is an API call. So this method is making a get call to get all of the accounts for the specified customer, is then deserializing the response into an array of account objects. And let's look at the API response for this call. So notice here we have an array of these account objects and each account has an ID, customer ID, type in balance. So I have this POJO class that has nothing but these fields as well as the getters and setters. And for any of you who've created POJO classes, um, which are plain old Java objects, um, meaning they just have some fields and then some getter and setter methods, for anyone who's done this, you know that this is tedious. And many people have moved to using the Lombok external library so they don't have to write all of this boilerplate code. But in Java 14, a new construct has been introduced called records. So this is a record, much, much shorter, right? Notice here, instead of using the word class, we use the word record. Also, as opposed to opening this with a curly brace, we use parentheses to declare the fields within there. You specify the fields and their data types in this comma delimited list, and then you close it, oops, clicky fingers, and then you close it um, with the paren and then a set of curly braces. And that's it, you don't need to make any getters, you don't need to make any setters, you don't need to override um, the inherited methods of equals and hash code or two string. All of this is just done for you and it's done quite nicely. However, if you just want to override anything, you can do so within the curly braces, okay? Now records can be instantiated just like classes. So account is the name of the record that we just saw. And we use the new keyword and we call the constructor passing in all of the values, just like we would if this was a regular class. The fields of a record are final. So there are no set methods generated for records. Of course, 
you can add a setter um, within the curly braces of the record, but I don't really see a good reason to do this since the fields are final, right? And they can't be modified anyway. You do have the accessor methods. Um, however, they don't start with the word get like we're used to. Instead, the accessor method name is the same as the field name. So notice the account.balance here as opposed to account.getBalance. Now, records were released as a preview feature in Java 14, which is the version we're on now. Um, this version was released in March. And what that means is it's not yet implemented as a, a permanent feature of the language. It's just available for us developers, you know, to play around with and to offer feedback. And based on that feedback, the implementation can change. So feel free to play around with records, but don't put this in your production code just yet because it could change. That also means that support from external libraries might not be available just yet. For example, the Jackson library is used to deserialize that JSON response into this record. However, the Jackson library doesn't officially support records yet, last time I checked. So as a hack, if you wanna play with this right now, you'll need to explicitly bind each field to its respective JSON property. And when and if records becomes permanent, I'm sure the Jackson project will provide support um, so that the explicit binding is not necessary. In fact, I already saw some tickets, some issues out on um, GitHub for this project. Okay, next I wanna show you some text blocks. Let's continue on with the API. What if instead of calling the API, we instead wanted to mock the data, right? Right there in the API util class. To represent this whole thing as a string would be very tedious. We need to escape all of the fields because they were already in quotation marks and we need to add new line characters for each line break and we need to add the plus sign for each line. And it's just ugly. It's ugly to read. It's ugly to write. Text blocks allow you to use three quotation marks to open and close a big block of text. And notice you don't need to escape anything if you're going to use these um, text blocks. The individual quotation marks are still there on the fields and the line breaks are respected. Now, text blocks were introduced in Java 13 as a preview feature, and we got a second preview in this latest release of Java 14. So this is still not a permanent feature just yet, but it is slated to become a permanent feature in the next release of Java, which is in September. So yay for text blocks. Okay, let's look at some rules and guidelines for text blocks. You cannot include the entire text block on the same line. You'll get a compilation error. And honestly, this doesn't make sense, right? This is a very small string. Just use the regular um, quotes here. Again, don't overdo stuff just because it's there, right? Um, so a new line must be after the opening quotes, like in this second example here. Now, this is legal, but this is not the preferred way. It looks a little bit goofy, right? The preferred way is to have both the opening and the closing quotes aligned. And that makes sense when it's a big block of text, right? Okay, one more thing I want to show you in that API class. Let's say that we didn't want the entire response, but we just wanted to return a hard-coded list of the expected account IDs. The old way of doing this would be to use the arrays dot as list method. However, in Java 9, this of method was introduced for all entities in the collection framework. So lists, maps, sets, etc. This one seems small, but I've actually been enjoying it. And I think the reason is because it's more natural for me. Um, before, it took like a cognitive effort to recall which class do I use to make a quick list? Is it Array, is it arrays, plural? Like, what is it? Um, but now, I want a list, I call list.of. I want a map, I call map.of. Nice and straightforward. And speaking of maps, populating these 
used to require a separate method call for each item that we wanted to add to the collection. But now you can define a map all in one line of code, right? So the parameters are key followed by value. And as you see here, we have three entries in this one call. Very nice. Now, one thing to note about using the of method is that it creates collections which are immutable. And what this means is that the collection cannot be changed by adding, removing, or sorting it later. So only use this when your collection won't require any changes later on in the execution. So there you have it. Um, these are a few of my favorite new features from recent versions of Java. I've been using them in different projects. I find them quite useful, even for test code. So what questions can I answer for you all? Let me see if I can find the chat. Hold on. Yeah, we have a lot of messages in the chat. Okay. I'll it's full. I, I personally have a question on pages. They tend, they used to have get and set meters, and sometimes when you're debugging, it was uh, useful to put a breakpoint there. Will the records provide similar functionality? Well, what is that uh, written down? I need to read it. I, I mean, the records. Will it be possible oh. to debug? Hey, Trisha. <laughs> yeah, Trisha G is there. <laughs> So, so ask the question again, I'm sorry. So for records, what's the question? Uh, will it be possible to put a breakpoint in records to debug them? Oh, I'm, yeah, I'm pretty sure. I don't see why not. I haven't done that, but I don't see why that would be a problem. Yeah, if you're adding more, um, unless you're using, is that the question? Like if you're using one of the ones that you don't actually see with your eyes? For example, if I'm calling one of the accessor methods, hmm, that's a great question. Now, what I do for things I don't know, because a lot of this stuff is exploratory, especially records, just came out in March. Um, for things I don't know, I write them down. I'm looking for paper. I write them down, and then I go and try it out, and then I write a blog post with the answer. So I, for, for, for records, uh, for, for any methods that you add to the record yourself, I'm sure you can put a break, part, break point on it, but for ones that you can't see, that's a great question. Can I put a break point? And that um, might be an um, IDE question. Can I bring in Trisha? Can she get unmuted to let us know if IntelliJ offers this? Yeah, I was just having a look to see if I can get it to work. Maybe if you move on to another question. Okay, okay, Trisha, I'll come back. Okay, wonderful. One more question was if people can get the recording of this uh, this Zoom, and I don't have answer for that. We will find it out. But when I came in, it said that it was recording, so I'm gonna say yes. But even if not, I do. I've done this talk before, and I have a recording on my YouTube channel if you want to see it. So guys, do you have more questions? If you could post them to the chat now because chat is so big, it's hard to find them. <laughs> people what are people are just... saying? I can't see the chat. Tell me what people are saying. On the first slide, they were asking why you're not using stream and I was just, <laughs> oh, oh, okay. <laughs> I was just waiting for them to come. And, um, and then people were asking why I'm not using filters, and I was waiting for this to come, and <laughs> you demoed it. <laughs> yeah, I had to I had to build build it up, you know. Yes, we have some people with C plus plus experience, and they were comparing records to constructions in C plus uh, plus. I don't remember which one. Okay, I see a few. Let me see. I'll jump in too. Um, someone says, is records feature ready now or do we need to turn on some experimental flag? I did have to turn on the um, preview feature in IntelliJ in order to use records. 
I I don't know about um, any other IDs, but I think it's just a matter of um, using the flag when you run the, the command to, to execute it. All right. They you see one? You jump into we'll tag team this. There's also a question about test automation because apparently the title of this talk was test automation when it was advertised. What was the question? Uh, the, the question was that this talk is about uh, Java features between 8 and 14. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually the title had uh, Java automation, Java test automation. Right. So everything we looked at, um, all of the code was actually test code, test automation code. Okay, so that's how we use new features in for automation purposes. Right, but it's applicable, you know, uh, to production code as well. But guys interested in test automation, if you go to the Test Automation University, is that it? Yes, Test Automation University, lots of free courses there. All of the courses are free. A um, lot of love for switch expressions I see in the comments. Said they're clean. Yeah, nice. Yay for records. Do the questions have to be only about what you have shown so far? Um, no, as long as they're not like way out there, like what did I eat for breakfast today or anything like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> By the way, the answer is nothing. <laughs> um, one year with no job and things seem to change a lot. Nice progress there. Yeah, I mean, it was really kind of um, stale for a while. And so it's really, really refreshing to see this. Um, anytime I post something about a new feature, uh, people who are using Kotlin and other languages are like, oh, good to see Java finally catching up, um, which, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> people asking about Test Automation University, if there are any courses regarding the new uh, Java 11 features. You Java know what, features? as I was giving this talk, I was thinking, hmm, I should probably make this as a course. Um, I'll, I'll think about doing that. If, if you have some interest in that, let me know. Um, you can let me know on Twitter or on LinkedIn or uh, my website. I'm easy to get in contact with. But yeah, if there's enough interest for something like that, I'd be happy to. I have an answer to the debugging question. All right, go for it. Currently, IntelliJ Idea 2020.2 does not support putting a breakpoint on a record um, like field thing. I can't remember what we call it. So you can put a breakpoint in the methods, of course, but not if you on make the... Your, if you make a, make a method yourself, but okay. Yeah. At the so moment, that's... it doesn't support it in the, um, what are they called? The property names. Yeah. And this is still an exper experimental feature. So this is feedback that we can give back to, you know, the project to say, yeah, you know, you might really want to put a breakpoint there um, and, and see if we can come up with something, a way to do that. Okay. Um, someone asked, can you put a breakpoint in the predicate like where you were doing um, the filtering of the array? Uh, in like that stream processing, yes, you can do breakpoints. Um, and that's why it's really encouraged to put them on separate lines like that uh, instead of doing the, the wicked one-liner because then it's easier to um, put a breakpoint on any of those sub calls. Um, is there a way to have builders with record types? So someone asked me this question before and I said, um, yes, you can have the builder, but 
the the fields are final right so if you're doing a builder and you're trying to basically set these fields that doesn't make much sense but there was someone if anybody remembers who this was there was someone who posted like on twitter and he went absolutely wild with records like he did some really um I don't want to say funky, funky, not in a bad way. So don't tell him I was dissing him or anything, but funky in a good way, um, stuff with records. And he actually found a way to like do builders. And I haven't um, dug deep into what he did to see like, why did that make sense to do? But I want to do that. So if, if that's something that's interesting to you, you want to do a builder, then go ahead and look for that. I'll try to find it as well and maybe um, have, have uh, Barry or Nikita send it out to the group. Okay, a lot of people saying yes uh, to the course for this. Um, Lombok and particularly as builder annotation works really well for larger pojos with record is a constructor with all parameters, the only way to create the object. Um, that's, I think I kind of answered that question with the builder thing. Maybe that's what he was getting at. Maybe he did the builder to build it out before actually create. I don't know. I got to dig into it. I don't know. All right. Um, I just think some time should be, should be spent deprecating or remove some of the functionality in Java. For example, there's at least three ways to iterate <laughs> through a collection. Okay. All right, I think I, being able to clear multi-line strings is brilliant. I know, I love that. I love that so much. Um, any popular frameworks for testing with Java, like Selenium? Does that work with Java? Yes. So um, there, Selenium works really well with Java. There's, I have a course on TAU uh, Selenium Java. So if you're interested in that, definitely check that out. I think the best feature was setting up a cleaner mock data. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. George says he's going to limit himself to Java 11 features. That's fine. Java uh, 11 is the LTS, so that's, that's perfectly acceptable. I'm just happy that you've moved beyond Java 8, so that's great. Um, which new features are you avoiding or finding less useful for test automation? Hmm. Um, hmm. So there's like um, new instance of pattern matching that um, looked really interesting, but I haven't like found a use case uh, within my test code to use it. So that's one just off the top of my head. Um, and that's the thing too, I love to explore new features and I'll do that like on my own time or, you know, kind of, it's kind of part of my job too, to play around with stuff. Um, but I try not to just use stuff just for the sake of using it. So it's one that I've tried just because I saw that it was new and I wanted to learn about it, but I haven't found uh, a useful for the type of code that I write. Um, which, what are most significant changes in this version of Java that have benefited your test automation methods? Um, most of the ones that I say here, I would, I would say VAR definitely. That one, oh my God, it's come in so handy. Um, because like I said, those page object classes are usually so long. And so to be able to not have to write that has been great. Also, um, the stream API, like I said, that came out in Java 8, but I don't see it used a lot in test code. And it's also been very, very useful for me um, in my test code at getting the things quicker and writer much shorter code. As you can see, as soon as I put the Java 8 code up, the chat went wild uh, asking, why aren't you using stream here? And why do you have these two? Exactly. <laughs> so that's how I had to do it back then. But now it's much more uh, useful using the stream API. All right. 
Are there any changes which enable us to handle checked exceptions in streams more elegantly? Um, I don't know. Does anyone know? Feel free to jump in. There's a question regarding a streams course at uh, Test Automation University. Is there anything on streams? So I, I ha in my Java course, I have a chapter that just touches on it like very briefly. Do I even touch on streams? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I think I do. But like just very briefly, um, probably not even as much as I did in this talk. So I, I'll think about doing something like that. There are uh, some things out there now from other people, um, not necessarily courses. There are courses, of course, but there's also like little katas and stuff like that that you can try to do more practice with. Um, I'll consider doing a course on Test Automation University for those who um, want it specifically for that. I think that would be pretty cool. Um, people, go people ahead. Also, yeah, people are also asking about Eclipse, if, if Eclipse supports records. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure. Anybody know? Feel free to jump in. People say that NetBeans does. Okay. Type inference will infer the type, but not the inference that's being implemented will infer the type, but not the interface that's being implemented. Like inferring from an array list will infer an array list type rather than a list. Hmm. 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 <laughs> now you got me thinking. Because, you know, you don't really know what, what Java is inferring it as, but I have access to all of my list methods when I do that inference like that. Huh, that's, that's an interesting perspective. Okay, I gotta, I'll write that one down too. Inference with interfaces. Okay. All right, um, mm -hmm. can var be used as global variable? No, um, it cannot be used for global variables, only local ones. All right. Imagine if you need to pass that object to a method taking a list, but it was inferred as an array list. Yeah. Okay, I gotta try it out. I'm like itching to go try it out now. Um, okay. <laughs> Anything else? I think um, I think I've gotten through all the questions. Um, if you think of something later, like I said, I'm very easy to find on uh, social media, or you can um, send me an email through my website angiejones.tech. Let me see. Can I change the slide? Yeah. So here's my contact information. Um, there's my link to my site, angiejones.tech. There's a link to Test Automation University. Um, and then that's my Twitter handle as well. So you can reach out to me on uh, any of those platforms, okay? Oh, there's one more question. Apart from perhaps some mad generic cases, can you pass a realist variable to meditate? Oh, there is just discussion. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you all so much. Um, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I appreciate you all taking time out this evening to stop by. All right. Take care.